<clears throat> I will read from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we make known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were witnesses of his majesty. For when we receive, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was bore to him by the majesty glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which were, you will do well to pay attention as to the lamp shining in dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless his own word. <clears throat> as you can see in this text, the main verse actually is in verse 16. The main verse is on 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myth where we make known to you the power and coming our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were witnesses of his majesty. Make known is the main, is the main verse here. So Peter said that when we make known to you the power and coming of the Lord, we did not follow cleverly devised myth, but eyewitness, eyewitnesses of his majesty. We refer to the, all the apostles. He says that we are not only the witnesses, but we, not only the witnesses of the power of the coming of the Lord, but we have the scripture is more fully confirmed a more sure word in the New American Standard, he said that we have the prophetic word more confirmed. So prophetic word is basically referring to the Bible, singular. So it's the body of the prophecy, which is the Old Testament at, during Peter's time. <clears throat> so our outline is very simple according to this. He said, how do we know the second coming because he said, verse 16, we make known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the, our first point is that they are the confirmed, confirmed witnesses. Say we are first-hand witnesses. We are not here from anyone. Secondly, we, they, we have the confirmed word of God that Jesus Christ is coming. So that will be our outline, outline today. <clears throat> Do you believe in the second coming of Christ? I'm sure all of you say, yes, we do. You know, of course, the first coming of Christ is to save us, and the second coming of Christ is to judge the world. And the question is, do you believe the second coming of Christ? And the answer, of course, you say yes. But if I look into your life, or you look into my life, can you be sure that I truly believe that statement? It's just like a mother keep telling the children, exam is coming. And he keep playing his video game. The mother said, the exam is coming. He said, I know. I believe you. But keep playing the video game. So the mother asked, do you know the exam is at, at, around the corner? The son said, yes. And he continued to play his video game. Do you think the son really understand the seriousness of the exam coming? It's just like some of us, if our bank account only have six months to pay for the utilities and uh, the, uh, our installment and so on, 
And then we don't do anything. If we lose our job, we're not going to do anything and we keep saying, yeah, I know, and do nothing. Do you really think he understands the weightiness of the matter? And months, day after day, week after the week, months after months, and you, you do nothing of it, that doesn't show. You believe in your head, doesn't know, doesn't mean that you will do it. You truly believe it in your heart. In the same way Christians say they believe in the second coming, yet when you look into their lives, they don't seem to believe what they are saying. It's just like some of us who study theology. We may be expert in our theology, but when you look into our life, you will know our theology. Theology is supposed to drive us down, down on our knee, not drive us up in our pride. So if you say you fully understand God, you understand the Bible, that will humble ourselves and, and, and prostrate before Him and wants to worship Him in fear and trembling. But when we say we know all the theology, all the system, and all the, the argument, and the way we present it would basically betray our words that we truly don't understand. And today is the same thing with second coming when you hear enough of the warning coming, coming, second coming, but none of us do take action to prepare ourselves. So today, do you truly believe the second coming? If your answer is yes, how are you preparing yourself? Yes, we need to earn a living. Yes, we, we have a lot of earthly responsibility we have to fulfill. But while we are doing that, we must be mindful of the fact that the world will come to an end. And the, the Lord will return to judge the world. If you have truly believed this, that will define your value system. They will inform your priority and it will change your life. So yes, we have early responsibility we need to fulfill, but you will not go ahead and build empire for yourself. You will not have all the ambition and wants to do everything that you can for in this world because everything will be destroyed. So are you ready for the second coming? So Peter basically says that we are very sure the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let us look into our first point, the confirmed weaknesses. The confirmed weaknesses. Look at verse 16, for we did not follow the cleverly devised myth where we make known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were witnesses of his majesty. For we receive honor and glory, for he received honor and glory from the Father. The voice was bore to him by majesty glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Apparently, Peter heard. People knew that the number, the number of false prophets already gone into the church and taught them there is no second coming. There is no second coming. If you jump forward to, to read verse chapter 3, verse 3 say, Knowing this, first of all, the scoffer will come in the last day when with scoffing, following their own de sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? So Peter knew that in the church, in the church, while there are people questioning while they are waiting and they, they are people questioning, where is his second coming? They become puzzled, they become confused, convoluted. So the question is, they start criticizing Peter and say, there's no such a thing. Therefore, Peter, in this case, he said, verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised meat. We did not follow anybody's story. We did not follow legend. We did not follow myth. We are the first hand witness of the power 
and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word cleverly devised is like something that makes you sophisticated, subtly concocted ideas. It's like something that it is so clever. And the myth it basically is legendary story of Greek gods and hero, heroic figures. He said, we didn't learn from all these things. We are first-hand witness of the, his, his power and the coming. And in fact, the word power and coming is interesting because we say we witness. So what we want to emphasize in this text is Peter saw the glory, the power, the majesty, and they are fear and tremble, trembling. And this is the experience they gone through while Jesus is on the holy mountain. And they exactly see it with their own eyes, hear it with their own ears. He see this. So these two words, power is talking about, that's the word dynamic or dynamite. And coming is really, parousia is basically the term that in the Bible, basic meaning is presence of the Lord. But in the technical term, in the whole Bible, uh, especially in New Testament, is referring to the second coming of Christ. If Jesus Christ is going to come, He's come to be present, we know that. And when He's coming, if you put together these two words, it means His powerful coming. Meaning, when we are living here, we believe and we are waiting His powerful coming in majesty, in power, and in, 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 uh, in His glory. So, in, in fact, this is not the first time we talk about this because Matthew ch chapter 25, verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, and then He will sit on His glorious throne. So can you imagine God, Jesus Christ, when He comes again, it's just not like the same Jesus Christ walk on the water. He this time come with all the angels, how many of these angels? And there will be lightning, there will be, there will be thunder, and there will be glory, and He will come in such a powerful presence. And the same thing, Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 say the same thing, where the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with His mighty angel in flaming fire. And why he comes here? He comes to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here he said, we saw the power, we saw the majesty, we saw the glory, and this cannot be compromised. We didn't hear from anyone. So what is he talking about? He's talking about his first-hand information. He said this eyewitness is like his first-hand eyewitness account. It's just like when, when, when we, when we see, read in the newspaper when somebody was, was murdered or, or committed a crime, they, they cannot hear from somebody. They must be there, first-hand experience, see with their own eyes, hear with their own voice, and they will have to piece together what happened that, on that day. And here we have first-hand accounts. So I do not know how you feel. I really feel that this Bible, especially this is... Peter's first-hand account. If you don't believe first-hand account, then who can you believe? And this is Peter's first-hand account and written in, in the scripture for us to read. So we are not hearing from second source. We hear it directly from, from him. And this so-called uh, uh, transfiguration here is really talking about uh, transfiguration. So it's really go back to Matthew chapter 17. On that day, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up in the high mountain by themselves. And over there, he was transfigured. He was transfigured before them, and he, his face shone like sun, and his clothes become white as light. So I don't know whether you try to look into the sun. Of course, you probably will not do that. But some, as a child, you probably try. And that will be the experience that when you see Jesus Christ when He come again, in full glory, in full majesty. 
And this is exactly when you come, when you see Jesus Christ in that manner, will you not bow? Will you not worship? Will you not be trembling? He said, they saw the transfigure before them. His light, bright sun shining, and his clothes became white as light. Even the clothing, the dress, become light. And verse 5 says that, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples hear this, they all fell on their faces and they were terrified. And that is what the right, proper response in fear. And this is what exactly Peter is saying. We are the first hand witnesses. We saw. We heard. We saw with our own eyes. We heard with our own ears. We saw that he transformed. He transfigured. He become like sun. His light. His clothing become like light. And we heard a voice from heaven saying, "This is my beloved son." Of course, when you say, "This is my beloved son," who is that speaking? Is God the Father? Have any one of you heard? God the Father speak in an audible voice? I would guess not. But he said, we heard. He said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And he's giving us instruction, listen to Jesus. And that's exactly what we will do. And this is exactly what we must do. We must listen, we must obey, and, and this is what God the Father wants us to do. And of course, when they know this, they, they felt and they were trembling. And what they, so when we come to our text, it says here, in our text say, For we did not follow cleverly devised myth, when we make known to you the power. Now they saw the power, they experienced the power. They sensed the power. And the coming of the Lord. Here we are talking about the kingdom descend from heaven on Mount Mount. They, they saw Jesus Christ, but they transfigure. And here we see the, the kingdom, the power descend on him. And they see, they saw this, they fell on their ground and they tra- terrified. And that is supposed to be what we need to proper respond is to fear God, to worship him. And that is what we must do. So Peter is saying that the second coming, I saw the power, it is true. And the kingdoms arrive. In fact, before this, the Lord already told them, some of you will see the kingdom before you die. Now, that is what they are referring to. So they are, eye, they are eyewitnesses. They are, this is first-hand account. They saw the, com- the power and coming of the kingdom. Not only they saw, they experienced, they heard. But they said, we have more, we have a confirmed word. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Verse 19 said, And when we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well pay attention as to lamps shining in dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So verse 13 says, but we have a more, prof- we have a prophetic word more fully confirmed. So here we are talking about a comparison. Comparison between what? In fact, he says that more fully confirmed. More fully is like compare what to what? 
more fully confirmed in the new American stating more sure. What is it compared? Which one is more sure? How to say more sure? So it's exactly comparing experience or scripture. Experience of scripture. So he's talking about if you, I, we have experienced this, but something is more important, more sure, more confirmed is the word of God. And that is the key. That is the key. Yes, we experience it. If you ignore our experience, the word of God is more powerful. And here is that's where he gives testi testimony to the word of God. And look, yes, you can experience many things. But I'll tell you this. As time passes, as your memory deteriorate you are fine your story keep changing and i say we thank god for the experience you have but don't trust your own experience you have to trust the word of god of course peter said it's undeniable that i saw this thank god for that we believe you but your experience had to be validated by the word of God. And that's why we always emphasize that return to the word of God and see it for yourself. And the word of God is inspired, is, is inerrant, is infallible, is all sufficient for truth and life. So you see, many times I go to, you know, in the past I, I, I go to China very often and as I preach there, and they always tell me very bizarre story. Did someone been to heaven and come back? Someone gone to the hell and come back? Someone see miracles and tell me a lot of things. And then some of them are so bizarre that, of course, we, out, we outright, we, we can write it off right away. But some is so, it, it, it is so clear, it, it, some of them is like, it's not outright wrong, but somewhere in between right and wrong. And how do I know which one is right? And I always tell them, what you experience through can I say that what you are saying and experience is equivalent to the scripture? Infallible? Inerrant? Oh no. Then I say, we better listen to the word of God. And your word of God confirm everything. You cannot veritate. You cannot use the experience to veritate the word of God. The word of God will veritate your experience. That should be our way to understand. So they will come and tell me many things. I'll say thank you for your sharing, your testimony. We praise God for that. But my faith is not depending on your experience. My faith is dependent on the infallible God of word. Not one John, one Peter will pass away. And this Bible has been here for thousands and thousands of years and not even one word, one John, one Peter will pass away. Is your experience equivalent to the Bible? So that it should be our standard. We thank God for all the experience. I can tell you many experience too. Miraculously things happen. But we should not base our faith on our experience. We should base it on the word of God. So otherwise we will open a wide door to all heresy coming in. And we cannot tell because Honestly, someone tell me something. I, I will ask them, how do I know God speak to you? You said so, I cannot verify. I do not know whether it's right or wrong. And I did not know that when your memory is correct, maybe you're in all honesty, tell me what you think, what as far as you can. But look, you probably, as time pass, as you age, you start, your memory become blur and become unclear. And, well, thank God that you have this experience. It may strengthen your faith, but we don't rely on things we can see. We rely on things we cannot see. And we rely, and what we really have as a standard is the Word of God. And that's why when you say here is that more fully confirmed. What is more fully confirmed is the Word of God. 
It's because it said prophetic word is a, a body of, of prophet or prophecies that put together. So this is the, the word of God that we need to, to experience, uh, we need to, to adhere to. And in fact, Paul, do you remember Paul being to third heaven? In fact, Paul said that he has been to uh, third heaven and he saw vision and revelation from God. And this is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, if I, have, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. Paul is saying, look, let me read first. If I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to vision and revelation of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, who caught up in third heaven, whether in body or out of body, I do not know, God knows. So I, I, I will say, Paul, is it out of body or in body? Don't know. So you're not sure. Then he said, you, you know, sometimes when you, when you experience some of these things, we thank God for you, we may strengthen you, but the point is this, it's unverifiable, unrepeatable, and incomprehensible. And in fact, Paul himself said this, they said, there's nothing to gain by that. Then Paul, why are you going on? Because I just want to prove to you I'm an apostle. I'm not proving to you about God. Say, look, I experienced this, but if you want to test me, I'm the apostle, I've been to third heaven, but this is nothing to gain by this. But the point is this, you must go back and check the Bible. That is what it needs to be done. So here it is telling us that we need to check the Bible. So experience is good. And many of us do experience, especially I, in fact, over the times you probably hear me say this, why do we experience certain miraculous things happen in our life? Usually it's when we are the most, we are weakest time and God needs to strengthen us. But when you are strong in faith, you believe in God, then all these miracles, we don't really depend on them. We depend on our faith to trust in God. Therefore, we must look into the word and be very sure this is what the Lord say. So verse 19 again, and when we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well, if you look into this, pay attention, it's just like lamp shining in dark place. It's just like morning star rises like the dawn. So it's like, if you have this scripture, the scripture will shine light into your life. It's just like night before dawn, the morning star appears. And why, how do we do that? It's coming back to the word of God. And verse 20 says, knowing this, first of all, this prophecy this prophecy, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy of come on, come on to someone's own interpretation. And of course, when we talk about this prophecy, last week probably some of you already uh, asked this question. Is the prophecy here referring to the whole Bible or is it just referring to the Old Testament. The answer, of course, is obvious. It's referring to the Old Testament. Because when Peter wrote this, New Testament has not been written yet. So we are talking about the Old Testament scripture is, is referring to that. But what about New Testament scripture? How can we trust it? And that's where, when we go to uh, chapter, three, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, P when Peter referred to Paul's writing, he said this, just as our brother, brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all letters when he speaks in them of this matter, there are something in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, twist to their own destruction, as they do to other scripture. Pay carefully attention. Peter is saying, Paul writes something, although it's hard to understand, you don't have anyhow twist it. If you twist it, you 
You twist Paul's letter, it's like you twist the old scripture. He put Paul's letter and the scripture, Old Testament scripture, on same par, equivalent. So over here is Peter acknowledged Paul written is inspired by God and you cannot anyhow interpret the way you want it. You have to interpret according to God's will. So that's why when we come to interpreting the scripture, we are very strict. We are very careful and we want to be very sure this is the word of God. So the word interpretation is a, is a, a, a difficult word here because the word inter interpretation, if you look into the text here, it says that um, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So prophecy of the scripture comes from anyone or someone's own understanding. But the word actually means no prophecy come from, it's, it's not really talking about interpretation or talking about explanation of the text. It's talking about, it's not coming out anybody or human's mind or human's will. That is what it meant. In the, in the Greek, in the Greek or the grammar, uh, grammar it's gen genitive, meaning it referring back to the, the one, the source. And of course, if you continue reading verse 21, he said, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. So he's saying that no prophecy is coming out from the will of man. Not, not for anybody to interpret it. You must interpret according to what God has intended. So we always be very careful in interpreting the Bible comparing scripture to scripture and that's what we call scripture interpret scripture and that's why we are very careful not to misrepresent the word of god so here it becomes important for us to see that this is the word of god so when we interpret the scripture we have to interpret in a way that is consistent with all the scripture so whenever we say scripture interpret scripture, we are referring to the first scripture interpret the second scripture. The first scripture, the word first scripture, we are talking about the whole Bible. In fact, you in, if you are reading, if you are interpreting one verse, you must have the knowledge of the entire Bible to interpret that one verse, so that we will not interpret it wrong. So the whole, therefore, we ask you to to keep reading familiarize yourself with the scripture it's just like any one person if you do not know a person he speak a word you thought he meant this it could be different but if you know the person for for 10 20 years every word he said i know what why he said that i know where he's coming from i know the experience i know everything so the more you know the scripture the more you understand the will of god the more you understand how to flow the scripture then we will help us understand every verse in the Bible. So when we come to interpretation, one of the most important thing is to familiar with the Bible first before you come to interpretation. That's why Morgan Campbell, uh, a British uh, prince of uh, interpretation of the Bible, says that before you interpret any scripture, you must read them at least 50 times. So you read and reread read and read. By the time you know how the flow of thoughts, the main theme and so on, then when you interpret one verse, you know how, how, it, how it fit into the whole, whole, whole scripture together. Therefore, we keep asking, we encouraging everybody, try, try to, to familiarize yourself. So you say, I don't understand, fine, read, keep reading. Read until you understand. In fact, when I was in the seminary, many times they asked us to read something. I say, they, one time they asked me to ask the student to read John Calvin's writing. And they said, don't use a modernized version. Use the original. And when I read the first time, I have no idea what it's talking about. And then, you know, finally I read 10 times. And then I figure out a little bit. And that's how, when you keep reading, keep reading, the more you read, the more you understand. 
And that's the same thing come to the Bible. Keep reading. So he said, I read, I don't understand. Fine, because you don't understand, that's why you read again. That's what happened. When you read a government letter, you say, I don't understand, then read again. Don't understand, read again. Read until you understand. And that is what we want, hopefully, you develop. But the more you read, the more you understand. The more you familiarize, the more you will understand the, 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 the thoughts of God. So keep reading, keep reading, that is important. So here you see that in this text, and we have prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as lamps shining in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of the scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of God. So you must understand the will of man, uh, the will of God, not will of man, but man spoken from God as they were carry along. The word carry along is like, it's like, it's the same word that you, have, well, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's less like he carry on along. So, of course, we, if we understand how the scripture is being written, every part of the scripture, you can tell this scripture is written by Paul or Peter or, or James because they all have their own personality. But at the same time, they carry the authority of God. Means God never override them. No, God never get them to dictate the word of God. But they use their personality and in, in mystically work between them, uh, work through them and carry them along and write something out. It's the, the, the penmanship is from the James or the author, but at the same time, it's still the Holy Spirit. Of course, when we study uh, the, the bibliology, uh, we understand that this is how the Bible is being inspired. So hopefully, when we start our uh, Bi Grace Bible School on, sun on Saturday, our prayer meeting, you will, let, you will get to know some of this uh, understanding. So here is that carry along. So let me conclude. You'll find that this text, why is this text here? Why did Paul want to say all these things? Uh, Peter, why did, Paul want to, why did Peter want to say all these words? It is be because Peter is about to be martyr. And he wants them not to unaware of this false teaching. And why he is, his purpose is not just to stop there and say, okay, I just want you to know this wrong teaching. But to what did he, to what end? He basically wanted them to prepare them for second coming. Prepare them for second coming. That's why, let me go back to verse 12. If you would take a look at your Bible, and we start, go back to verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12. Say, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it is right, as long as I am in the, this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that I'm the putting off my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, verse 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to at any time recall these things. So first of all, um, Peter is saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to die soon. So a person before he died, all the words have become very critical and important because he's about to write, die and what he said is his will. And he said that I'm about to put off my body and my departure is imminent. So listen carefully. These are important. Then of course, last week we did highlight to you the word remind. Therefore, I intend to remind you. And then of course, and uh, the, the subsequent word, reminder in verse 13, it is right as long as I'm in the body to stir you up by way of reminder. And then last verse, verse 15, so that you can recall these things. So Peter is saying, look, I never tell you anything new. I've been telling you before, but before I go, be reminded. Remember this. After I go, do remember. So this is very important. What is it that is so important? So remember these things, what these things are. So these things refer, in fact, this thing 
in verse 12 said, Therefore I intend to remind you this quality. What is this quality? Again, we push forward the preceding text. What the preceding text is saying here, go back to verse 5. Go back to verse 5. Verse 5 said, chapter 1, verse 5 said, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly love, brotherly love with, with brotherly affection with love. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he said that because of this reason, last week we did saying what reason? Because God empowers you, God divinely bestows on you, He gives you all the power that is pertaining to God, to, to life and godliness. Therefore, you make every effort. That's why make every effort is the word saying that. In fact, the word has not just make every effort. It has to be a time signature. Be quick. Be shift. To do with eagerness, with earnestness, with diligence, with zeal. And pull all your, your fiber in your body to, to do this thing. See, before I die, very important that Jesus Christ has come again and you need to put all this in place. What are, what are these things? He said, supplement with your faith. There are seven qualities here. And the word supplement is, as I mentioned to you last time, is a choir master who, who brings out the best of all the talent. He said, bring this out. And here he said, so that you will not be ineffective. You will not be unfruitful. In fact, if you are unfruitful and ineffective, you may question your, whether you are even a Christian or not. But if you are effective and fruitful, and you know for sure, verse 10 says, Therefore, brother, be all the more diligent to confirm. The word more diligent again happens again, so it's for emphasis. To confirm your calling in elections. That's why Jesus Christ is coming. Before I die, I need to tell you, Pursue these things so that your election, your salvation is sure. Now you see what a pastor's heart. He said, before I die, I just want to make sure that you know you are saved. You need to make sure. And I want to see you on the other side of the, the horizon. And what I need to do, he said, therefore be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. And for this way, you will be richly provided, in verse 11, you will be richly provided for you an entrance into eternal kingdom. So he said, this is talking about salvation. So before I die, please check your life. Are you saved? If you are saved, you are truly saved, then he says that supplement, supplement your faith with virtue supplement with so that's why the word supplement and last week we talked about this is more like choir master pull together god endow us with all the gift use it once you use it you know so what he's saying that supplement your faith with virtue so he lists down seven items seven items on top of faith he start with faith and with love so he said, start with virtue. The word virtue, basically, I'm repeating last week's sermon here. Virtue means, the word virtue is actually, you can translate it character in classical Greek, translate it in, in, uh, in virtue, in character. And here is not any character, it's an excellent character. But what you're saying is, you say you're safe. Are you happy with that? No, you should not. After you're being saved, God didn't save you so that you can sin some more. God save you so that you can be excellent testimony for Him. So you cannot be satisfied that once you save and then you, you just let it cruise on and do nothing. He said once you are saved, you must have excellent character. Therefore, when we come together, we must encourage each other. Look, we need to share the gospel. But then, after that, we need to build our character. You have to have moral excellence. So therefore, encourage one another to be more compassionate, more graceful, 
more holy, more loving. This is what we need to do and we need to come together and build this culture in this church. So that people walk in, they can feel this church is really God-fearing and this is holy and it's, it's very warm because it's full of love, full of compassion and also patient because we are all different walks of life. We are all work in progress. We are bound to have something that hurt somebody, somebody not happy with some, something. But we are being patient and, and be tolerant and endurance so on and so forth. So therefore, he says, supplement your faith with action, character, meaning good moral standing. And in, in fact, the word translate excellent, excellent. And then he says that not only that, faith plus action plus then plus knowledge. You should not dare do stop there. Start pursuing. Read your Bible. Not only the Bible. Read. Understand. Theology has to build on the knowledge. Build on the Bible. All theology has to be based on exegesis of the Scripture. So theology don't stand alone. So of course you will see there's some very philosophical argument about theology. Personally, I'm not interested. I'm only interested in theology, reason derived from the Word of God, not from the human understanding. So you have to have knowledge. After knowledge, you have to have self-control. Now you, you have all the knowledge, yet you don't know how to control yourself. How, how good is it? So that's why I say you want to look at, the, you want to look at the person with the, uh, deep theology, look at their life. If they have a very control life, they control their temper, they control their pride, they control their appetite. This is the person who truly know the scripture. Just I mentioned to you, theology get you down, don't get you up. Get you down on your knees. Don't get you up in your pride. And then when you have self-control, then you learn steadfastness is really endurance. It's really talking about patience. It's really talking about, yes, as I mentioned, all of us, including myself, none of us can call perfect. Therefore, if I'm not perfect, I'll probably hurt somebody somewhere. The problem is I don't know. And somebody remind us, then we say, okay, we change. That's why, that's, then we will, will, will react We love. So we need to be perseverant. We need to be patient. We need to endure. And then we need to also grow in godliness. The word godliness, anything got to do with God. So can anybody say this behavior is godly? Of course, we have different degree of godliness. When you first become a Christian, the first year and then the 10 year and the 20 year, hopefully you see the godliness improve. The more understanding in God's God character, you change. And we need to encourage each other. So we put up with each other because we are all different maturity. Then we will, we will learn because we all belong to the fam spiritual family of God. And then we, uh, we will react differently depending on our, our maturity. So sometimes people ask me, how come you're so harsh on me? And then so nice to the other person. I say, he, he, he is very young, so we need to shower a lot more love. But if you are already been uh, in a Christian uh, in the relationship, then I say, you have, I should have higher demand on you. If I continue to treat you like an unbeliever, that's why I'm in doubt you, so that you never grow. So I think we need that kind of understanding. Therefore, we grow in godliness. And then, therefore, godliness in 1 Timothy, he says that godliness is, is of value in every way as a whole promise of the present life and, and the life to come. And then, of course, once you have godliness, then you want to have brotherly love. That's brotherly love in Philadelphia is basically the word is basically family love. We love like family. And then finally we have love uh, agape love, meaning you treat everybody unconditionally love, just like Jesus Christ, just like the Lord loves us. Just like when we are in sinner, we are in sin, he still loves us and he died for us. So having said that. We come to that, ask ourselves, now you are Christian, what do you do next? You need to have spiritual pursuit. Less pursuit in our character. Try to build our character, try to increase our knowledge, try to control our, 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 our body, and try to be patient with one another, and learn, grow in godliness. 
can we be affectionate as a family and then also outside the church we want to have agape love meaning we want to love the sinners as God does and share gospel there and so can we come together and learn and say okay these are seven quality of course there are more than this but this 70 can we put together and say how do we develop this let's come and develop this and before the Lord comes again if you do all these things Peter said then you will not be ineffective or unfruitful so now my question to you is are you doing this or we just cruise along and I'm afraid that some of us in certain degree of uh, pursuing different uh, different level but all in all we need to come together and help each other to grow in this direction and again Paul uh, Peter said that make every effort more diligent if you are more diligent make your salvation sure then when Jesus Christ come again he already proved that Jesus Christ come again is for sure but in this text if you link up uh, in contact he's saying that let's pursue this and this is the word of Peter before he died how important is this I would say this is very very important and I know you said you say it last week the question is this from last week to this week do you put any of this in action may we all come together let's follow God's will and build each other up and to please God shall we pray together father as we come before you we know it sounds like simple message but it is we have to have self-denial we have to have faith and it's not salvation by work but it's a salvation by faith but faith we need to have fruits so father we pray that we have unity together as a church that we want to pursue this quality as you inspire Peter to write and we want to follow you and may we as a church grow together and we have so much work to do may we not slacken may we put our heart together and we full of love full of passion full of compassion full of grace that we hold each other together as we grow may you bless each and every one and our church in Christ's name we pray Amen